Hey guys, welcome back to Ranger Survival and Fieldcraft. I'm Andrew, and what I have for you today is alone 10 survival items. Now we have is just a little multi-tool for a knife. We can go ahead and cut all this grass to get thatching for our shelter and then for our bed tonight. But a little trick out here in the Great Plains anyway for grass that's already matted down for us from the wind and from the weather is to find a good mat like this and then simply pull it back the opposite direction of the dominant wind. So in this case, we're gonna pull it north and then lift all that grass up and bring it out in one piece. All right, shelter. Now for our 10 items for survival, we've got our sleeping bag. It goes down to about 15 degrees. Probably change it out for something warmer in colder climates. But out here in the Great Plains, it's going to be good enough for tonight. Tonight's only going to get down to about 17 degrees or so, so we've got two degrees to spare. Now, when we talk about shelter out here in the Great Plains, we don't have a lot of timber sources to pull from and make a really sturdy shelter. We've got to think outside the box for a shelter for a night or two or three before we can find something or make something a little bit more longer lasting and warmer. Two things we have a lot of, prairie grass and then these thickets. We can grab a ton of prairie grass, pulling it up the opposite direction that the wind blew it over and just peel that grass back into nice big chunks. Bring it back here, four inches of compressed debris minimum on the forest floor to insulate us from the ground. We'll probably add more later on today. And then we have these thickets. All we have to do is pull them down, lash them together in the best way possible, and then create that lattice work, grab more prairie grass, and just line the outside of our shelter with that to create a simple overhead shelter. Now with this, we're not worried so much about insulation as we are a wind block. The direction the wind comes from predominantly this time of year is gonna be from the south, the west, and the north. It's cold, we just want a shelter that is going to block that wind for us and keep us warm underneath that shelter since we've got a good sleeping bag and a good debris bed. So we have something to sleep on, something to sleep in, and then something to sleep under to protect us from precipitation. And then most importantly, that wind to keep us warm throughout the night.
one of the main tools I would definitely bring as part of my 10 piece kit would be a giant saw like this one takes down material very easily it is a calorie saver and we can collect and gather a lot of wood for shelter and for fire and for survival but this saw or a big one just like it would be perfect and would be a part of my kit Now, these are very crude tools, fashion them with our ax in just a few minutes, but we have a mallet and then some wedges. We can use these tools, just created off the landscape, to split large sections of log like this guy right here and help increase the longevity of our ax by using our tools here and creating a simple cut with the head of our ax and then just using the wedges and the mallet, we can split this large log for shelter craft for fire while increasing the longevity, reducing the chances of error and injury to ourselves over time with this ax, given that we're going to lose strength, lose stamina, lose endurance and focus, and our mental acuity is gonna go down. So using tools created from the landscape not only protects our equipment, but then protects us through a long-term survival situation.
All right, we have to go a few miles to the south before we hit a body of water with any fish in it. So we're gonna snare instead. Depending on the animal that we're going after, we set the noose and we use appropriate wire for that animal. In this area, there are a ton of small rabbits that like to come out at night and we're already in a thicket near tall grass where those animals naturally funnel and there's a lot of different obstacles and little trails in here where we can set snares and attempt to catch some game. So that size, maybe a little larger, a little smaller is good for a rabbit. Squirrels, we can probably go down to two fingers and make the noose just a little bit smaller. But there's plenty of rabbits in this area, so we can go ahead and set up some of these snares and attempt to catch some game. All right, you can see behind me, there's a very large game trail made by deer. You can tell because there are rubs along these trees in the area made by deer that pass through here. They move from their bedding location through this thicket and cover out to the field and then to their feeding location in a watering hole to feed and water themselves and they continue their movement throughout the night. What we want to look for for rabbits are the small offshoots off of this large game trail because all the animals are going to use this large game trail and then shoot off to their den location. We want to look for animal scat and then for possible den sites and hang snares around those areas and try to funnel those animals, the small rabbits, into those snares to attempt to catch them. You got a rabbit right here. Then you also have pheasant droppings. So we have rabbit and pheasant in the area. That is a lot of deer poop. How do you tell the difference between rabbit poop and deer poop? Now, deer poop is gonna be larger in diameter, generally the same shape, but it's gonna be a lot darker. Rabbit poop is gonna be smaller. It's gonna be a green shape, all right? Now these pellets kind of look similar and they tend to dry out over time and so that deer poop may turn the same color as that rabbit poop. However, deer tend to defecate all in one location. So you're gonna have a giant pile of deer pellets in one location. And then you're gonna have rabbits. They tend to spread that stuff out. So you're gonna have one or two pellets here or there in a general trail or location. And it's kind of spread out over a habitat area as they move along and feed on different plants. So that's how you tell the difference between rabbit poop and deer poop. We have fun. Get out of here. <laughs> oh, but he's frozen solid. 
That's awesome. Now, truth be told, I was out here setting up snares just to see on the off chance right before this video, if we left something out, if we could get a rabbit. And obviously it paid off. There's tons of sign in this area. The rabbits run through here all the time, trying to go out to feed in different locations and moving back to their dens. But we got a rabbit. Now, my survival instructors in the military always made it a point to say, if you get any game, quarter it or chop it up into meal-sized portions before you freeze it if you're in a winter survival scenario or out where it's cold where this guy could freeze now we can't do that obviously because he's frozen but i got another technique to where we can clean this guy out and get him ready to cook all right so i saved you the gory details but a method that we can do with frozen game that's already dead in our snare that was left out overnight and below freezing temperatures it hasn't been above freezing here for a few days now even during the daytime but we can take our axe and we can chop that animal up into portions that we can successfully clean and get the bad contents out like the contents of the stomach and all the guts that we don't need get that out of the animal so that we can safely thaw it next to the fire and then remove the fur from that animal and finally cook it in our cook pot or over the fire all right so we have different portions of our rabbit here now this is not a very pleasant activity i don't enjoy doing this very much but you'll notice that we have a pretty good cross section of the animal here and all we have to do now is simply remove the contents with our knife remember to clean our knife afterwards and we can quarter this animal up go back thought and remove the fur so it's a very easy process one leg two legs we'll save up every little scrap we have to save for future traps you can see here's all the frozen guts all right that was in that rabbit good to go so we've got our two legs we'll put it with our spine our back end over here but that is a method All right, so the bow drill, awesome technique to 
get a fire going using primitive methods. All we need is just a little bit of cordage and then to carve the pieces from dead, dry, soft wood. We can get an ember very quickly and then transfer that to a tinder bundle to get flame. And now we have a fire. We're gonna keep the fire small because we are in prairie land and it's nothing but prairie grass around here. So we wanna avoid any fire accidents by catching grass on fire. So it's gonna be a small fire tonight. But what we used to start out with was a log behind with some bark underneath and that bark underneath is so our fire can lay on something dry and then we have that log behind which is an army method where we just have that platform we can put our tinder in and then lay our fuel on top and we're good to go now clearly we shouldn't rely on primitive means to start a fire out in the wilderness, especially when we only have 10 items with us. We need to bring a way to start fire, knowing how to pull resources and materials from around the area, especially like this dead dry cottonwood, to make a bow drill set and then be able to get friction fire and start that fire is important as a backup, but it shouldn't be our primary. So our primary fire starter is gonna be that ferro rod. And it's easy enough to get things to light out here because all we're surrounded with is dead, dry grass. What? I'm not a complete heathen. Pretty good. A little gamey, but it's still good. Really hot. Hot. It's really good, especially when you haven't eaten all day. Come <laughs> on. 
you know, when you start to hear gunshots in the morning around here, that means hunters are out, obviously, hunting pheasant. So, time to get up. It's a nice morning. How about we do a little target practice? So we've incorporated all 10 items in our video thus far, but let's quickly summarize that 10 piece survival kit. Now we've got our sleeping bag, 15 degrees. Probably wanna get one that goes even further down, maybe zero degrees for shelter at night to stay warm. We've got our forest ax, take down material, then make tools with this, good to go. We have our large saw, calorie saver to take down really large sections of material to move back to camp for firewood or shelter craft. But a large saw like this, very easy to use, especially after being tired. Now for a knife or a cutting tool, I would go for a multi-tool. That way we can cut wire and manipulate objects that we may find or scavenge. Plus a multi-tool has a straight blade. It's gonna have a serrated blade, a small saw, which is great for notch carving and has an all or a reamer, and then what I like especially about this one is that it has scissors. This is the Leatherman P4, which a lot of people use, but very easy to use. Silver color, in case we drop it, we can identify it and find it easily because it'll shine off the sun. But a good tool like this, a lot of different functions that we can do for camp craft and wood craft with it. And we have larger cutting tools to process bigger sections of material. Now for our pot, two quart is the max. So we have this solo stove, 1800, 64 ounces of volume in here. Cook in this, boil water in this, bake in this, use this as a container to gather materials. We can suspend it over a fire and then we have the hand holes to put it directly in the fire. This gives us a lot of options at camp when we're doing all of our camp craft, like processing game, cooking it, and then boiling water. We have a lot of different options for setup, depending on our situation. Snare wire, food is a make or break, so we should probably bring a lot of different resources and materials to catch game. Snare wire being one of those, we can bring all different types as much as we can at different gauges, and then set traps for different game in the area, and then we just passively hunt. All we have to do is walk around, check those traps routinely, and then pull the game from those traps, and we have food. With snare wire, the same thing with fishing kit. We should probably bring a robust fishing kit if we're near a water source or we're going to be somewhere where there is a lot of fish. We can set up a lot of different fishing lines to actively or passively fish and then possibly take some of this line or 550 cord guts and make a gill net and 
construct that net to place it in the water to passively hunt. So we can do both active and passive hunting or fishing with a good fishing kit. All right, paracord or 550 cord as much as we can and probably change up just a little bit for color and switch out a few hanks for camo and then some colored cordage. That way we can set up different traps or use that cordage, the ones that's brightly colored for snares or for lures on our fishing line or whatever we need to, but we can use the guts, take it all out and then construct a net with it or other traps, but cordage is a must. And then for fire, a giant ferro rod seems to be the standard, but we take this and then we have alternate means to start fire based on our knowledge and skill. We can pull material from the landscape, create a bow drill, and attempt to get friction, fire, and sustain flame that way. But we want to have this to start fire, definitely. We want to rely on bow drill or primitive methods as a secondary or alternate option to this ferro rod in the event we lose this for whatever reason it's happened but we hang on to this. This is our primary fire lighting device, and this is what's going in our kit. And then lastly, I'm an archer like so many out there, but I would take a bow along with arrows and attempt to actively hunt game in the area. Large game equals a lot of food, plus we can use everything from that large game, the bones, the fat, everything, even the hide, to create different tools and different options for us out in the wild, but definitely to go after larger game to have more food and more resources available. So a bow and arrows is gonna be our 10th item. So a little bit longer of a video today. This was a great recommendation from you in the comment sections about 10 items for survival kit based off the show alone. Now I've only seen one or two seasons of Alone, but uh, if I ever got offered a spot to go out there and compete in that show, I would do it in a heartbeat. But 10 items for our survival kit. We have a wide variety of things here. Most importantly, to hunt passively and actively, fish as well, to get game and get food to sustain us through a long-term survival scenario. And then we have different tools and shelter items as well as pots and our fire lighting devices and cordages to make shelter, camp craft, wood craft, make traps, make nets, make any tools that we need. But there's a wide variety of items right here that give us a lot of options, especially when we're out there using natural material and the things we may scavenge. So I hope you guys like this video. If you did like this video, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, leave me a comment in the comment section. I always appreciate your feedback. I wanna thank you guys for everything you do for me and for this channel, and for all your likes, your views, your subscriptions, your comments, your feedback, and your shares. And I'll be back with another video as soon as I can, guys. Thanks.